drug developers, investors, researchers, and corporate executives wrestle weekly to understand what is happening in commercial development of NASH medications. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Stephen Harrison, C-suite veteran Peter Traber, and forecasting and pricing guru Roger Green as they discuss the issues affecting the evolving NASH market from their own unique perspectives on this week's edition of Surfing the NASH Tsunami. For everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, surf's up. Episode 26 of Surfing the NASH Tsunami starts now. Wow. By the time you hear the next episode, we will already be into autumn. This is the dog days of summer, last episode of summer. So we want to end the summer of 2020 with an inspiring topic. What will life for liver patients and people who treat them be like when we are beyond the biopsy, when we don't have to rely on liver biopsy as a gold standard for so much of what we do? Donna is back from having started a program by that name, Beyond the Biopsy with Global Liver Institute, at the beginning of the month, and she'll be talking about that. This week, the only folks here are us us regulars, uh, Donna, Louise, Stephen, me. So we should have plenty of time to talk slowly, think slowly, dive into this issue from several different vantage points. I think it's a fantastic issue. Before we get started, here at Surfing Nash, we're delighted that listenership uh, for the digital ILC episodes continues to grow. Cooler still, uh, people who came to us through ILC or we found us after having been away for a while have gone back and started listening to the old episodes. There are four or five old episodes that have virtually well grown at least 50% in listenership in the last month, month and a half, including some that we thought were pretty well listened to in the first place. At the end of this episode, I'll ask this question again if we have time, and I will be posting on the discussion board two questions for all of you to come answer. One is we plan our coverage for digital ASLD in November. What features from ILC should we make sure to keep and what should we change? Second, if you've gone back into our older episodes, which ones did you like best? If you haven't, which ones do you remember best? Why is that? And are there any topics in the old episodes that we should revisit over the next couple of months to another episode and say, well, gee, what's going on with this? As if to anticipate that, we got a note from a listener this week that actually talked about how much he loved our coverage, but I'm going to go past the remarkably flowery prose to touch on the two issues that I just asked. What he said he liked best was our ability to churn out daily updates during ILC that were well prepared and that covered topics accurately and where he knew exactly what he was going to get in the episode. His favorite old episode was episode 12, where we discussed the implications of Intercept having received this uh, complete response letter and that we could cover it within three or four days after news of the letter came out. So what are your thoughts? Please come to the discussion group or send us an email and let us know, and we will incorporate that into our planning. Music, we're still staying with Jeff Ramsdale and the British Liver Trust because it's such a nice, calm, placid, and brilliantly uh, talented way to go out at the end of an episode. And with that, deep breath, let's go on to the podcast. Let's start with personal highlights this week. Brave one, go first. I'll, I'll, I'll give a serious one and a light one. The, the serious one is is that my husband has you know been successfully medically managed with having bilateral DVTs that almost scared the life out of me to to think of losing him that way. And luckily he is a brilliant physician and diagnosed himself and with our care team, we, we got in the ER and uh, had an amazing experience uh, there. So kudos to Sibley Memorial Hospital here in Washington, D.C. for getting things in hand so quickly. On the lighter note, because as if that wasn't enough, saving, saving both of our lives, frankly. I discovered that you can get a foam roller on a stick. You don't have to do that crazy, you know, lay on your back uh, over the horrible foam roller contortionist nonsense. You can just get one on a stick like a rolling pin and roll out your muscles. And so I consider both of those very significant successes of the week. That's funny. When I had a foam roller and I had a dog, the dog would roll on the floor with me when I was foam rolling as if we were doing it together. (laughs) I suppose mine's actually more of a professional one, spending three days um, scanning in homeless people's units around one of the counties and one of the drug and alcohol services, which was enlightening, educational and very engaging. So it was a thoroughly excellent three days. Well, this is really a light note compared to the altruistic comments that Louise made and the life-threatening situation that Donna lived through. So this this bit of uh, brevity will be nice to hear. So my daughter is a senior in high school. She just started 
her last year two weeks ago. She's number two in her class and, and is, is everything I wish I, I was in high school but didn't do. And so now we're at the, looking for colleges. And I, it's, it's, I guess, encouraging to note that she's narrowed her choices down to the University of Texas in Austin, Hookham, or the SMU Mustangs in Dallas. That's much to my son's chagrin, who is a sophomore at Texas A&M. And if anybody knows anything about the state of Texas, you would have a house divided if I have a UT Longhorn and a Texas A&M Aggie at the same location. Uh, so anyway, a bit of a challenge to come as we move forward. I'm secretly hoping she chooses SMU, so I don't have to go uh, through that. But I can imagine <laughs> where I have a T-shirt that's half maroon and half burnt orange. You can do a lot with that, Steve, and you can make the front one and the back other. You can split it right down the middle on both sides. You can have alternating colors that way, so it's kind of like Jester. I think, this is, I think this might have a future. Lot, lots of options, for sure. I can't imagine what would happen. Uh, good thing they're not in the same conference in football anymore. I hope I don't wind up regretting this later, and I don't think I will. But my personal highlight is after not having been on an airplane since um, March, I'm getting on an airplane on Thursday. And I'm getting on an airplane to go to uh, a low-risk, low-COVID environment like Texas because uh, I want to go see my granddaughter, who I haven't seen in two months. In fact, I will be doing the podcast next Monday from Corpus Christi, Texas, and um, we'll be there for a week. My granddaughter is beside herself. She's shrieking on the phone. That is when she, that is when the dog's not in the room, because if the dog's in the room, everything else goes straight out the window. So we're really excited about this. And Just make the, sure there's no tropical depression moving into the Gulf. They're, they're coming through so fast, Stephen. I don't know how I could you know, plan for it, right, for, for an eight-day trip. A eight-day trip. You definitely are gonna. Uh, uh, you're gonna have uh, the Weather Channel on at some point. Sure, that's right. <laughs> Just take so, plenty of bedtime stories. Yes, well, that's that's one of the things we're doing. We read to her by Zoom now, but we're really excited to get to read to her in person again. And with that, a start that covers kind of all the different aspects of life in one form or another. Let's go on. Let's go on to the main topic. On August 31st, Global Liver Institute kicked off a month-long campaign called Beyond the Biopsy. And I quote, dedicated to accelerating the acceptance and adoption of non-invasive diagnostics as an alternative to biopsy. Donna is, as the um, CEO of Global Liver Institute, one of the leading voices for this initiative. Uh, having her on this program today is, I think, the best way one could imagine to talk about it. So, Donna, why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about what it is, how it works, what you're doing, what the motivation was? Sure. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I'll, I'll start with the, the motivation for it. You know, the Global Liver Institute is very focused on looking at the entire field of liver health and determining where the gaps are, where the opportunities are, what are the barriers to achieving best practices or, or best outcomes. And so when we were starting our work in NASH, it became very clearly uh, and quickly apparent that a dependence and a definition of the disease on liver biopsy was the rate limiting factor for you name it, for patients participating in research, for studies being enrolled, for drugs being approved, for people getting access to, to treatment, for people getting uh, diagnosed accurately. We spent a lot of time you know, talking and researching and, and thinking about what could be done. One you know, big thing is just, was just awareness, particularly when we started conceptualizing this, there, there wasn't a pervasive awareness that there were alternatives to liver biopsy, let alone the great diversity of innovations that, that we've seen now and were quite uh, well featured at, at EASL. And so when you think about the general population in particular, because when you think about a, a condition or a disease as prevalent as, as NASH's, you really do need to start talking to the larger public. There we hit the familiar walls of low levels of, of liver disease, you know, no awareness of, of NASH as a whole. To then ha hit this issue of, of biopsy, we really needed to shine a spotlight on the drawbacks of biopsy, you know, one, uh, for something that's called a gold standard, it, it seems rather tarnished to me. <laughs> um, and then the alternatives and, and offering an opportunity for 
so many uh, who are working in, in so many different, you know, academic labs, government labs, companies, research networks, like, like, like Stevens on all these different innovations in non-invasive diagnostics to create a platform for those discussions. Then the second phase that, that, you know, we'll move into is really encouraging the adoption um, we see that already in clinical management, but encouraging the adoption in, in guidelines, in formal policies, in payer policies. But before we get there, we really needed to just shine this spotlight and start having this conversation. So we've created some materials and some questions, but, but the heart of it really is a radio media tour that uh, I was so honored to do with our good friend, uh, Mazen Nuruddin from Cedars Sinai Fatty Liver Disease Clinic. And he was you know, well known to those of us in the Nash field. And we did, gosh, 14 uh, radio interviews, all different areas of the country on the morning of August 31st. Luckily we were still on easel time, so it, it, it didn't seem that early. But we launched this, um, this campaign with this radio media tour. And then we are having a series of Facebook Live discussions grounded in different localities um, because we wanted to understand you know, what was available to people in the different localities and see how different locations might be you know, leveraging different technologies or thinking about them in, in, in new ways. We did one in Colorado and we had the you know, involvement of um, Congressman Jason Crow, former Army Ranger and uh, a member of the Healthcare Innovation Caucus, also member of the Congressional Diabetes Caucus, which I think is a really important collaboration for us to make. And then we'll be going to Massachusetts, um, where we'll have Ray Chung and others, uh, you know, Dr. Chung being the incoming ASLD president, so we're so excited to have him. And in New York, um, Scott Friedman will uh, lead the conversation there. And then we'll, we'll wrap up sort of summarizing you know, what we've seen across the country and across the research and in uh, consortia like uh, Nimble and Litmus uh, with Dr. Um, Arun Sanyal. So I'm really excited about how this has come together and the content that we're being created for everyone to be able to carry forward to discuss why um, alternatives to, to biopsy are, you know, here to stay, are evolving, are real, and uh, really need to be what we all look forward to seeing, hopefully long before 2025 as, as standard of care. That's great. So without tipping off the last episode, when you put all this together, what are you learning and what of it are you finding surprising? You know, I, I have often used the phrase, patients are very practical. And uh, the radio interviews that, that we did where um, in some cases, the radio interview themselves um, had NASH. And so they were very like, what are my risks? What, you know, where do, I, where do I need to go? What type of doctor do I need to get to? Those were very telling when it became very personal, when somebody themselves or, had a, or a member of their family had some connection to liver disease, that definitely went into, uh, into one, one direction. But the theme throughout the 14 that we've done so far have been a sense of sort of consternation. Why are we still doing it? this thing where you stab me in the side and wait for me to not bleed out for a few hours like why why is this still done when we have better ways to to do it so it tipped for me it wasn't the alternatives that we had to explain the value of to people it was the why have we ever, or why would we want to continue perpetuating biopsies for a moment longer? I've got a question, and it's more in relation to the fact that what do you see as the biggest challenge? Is it the lack of awareness and information from within the patient groups, if you're an endocrine patient or if you're a cardiovascular patient? Or is our biggest challenge and your biggest challenge actually healthcare, getting those disciplines to recognise, and many more, that the liver underpins a lot of the processes that make their diseases happen. So which is the biggest challenge? To your first question about you know awareness, particularly within high-risk com communities, I can't really call it a challenge because there's it's there's nothing there there's no there's no awareness there we're gonna have to build it to push so i don't think there will be resistance to that it, it just really hasn't been anybody's effort yet 
we, and we are reaching out um, as part of our overall NASH initiatives. The challenge, I believe, is in the lack of consensus around which diagnostic to use in what setting and it has, you know, what value and we interpret it. If we could go to endocrinology or primary care and say, we, the United Hepatology community, believe that this test is what you should use to screen your patients or this test is, you know, what you should use to differentiate between uh, or stage them, then we would get incredible receptivity. But we don't have that clarity ourselves. And so, you know, as they say, you cannot give what you do not have. So, so it's that lack of clarity that is stymieing the process. That's true. So, so, so Stephen, do you envision a circumstance under which that kind of clarity will, at that level, will become um, realistic in the States? Yeah, I do. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate Donna for her effort. I think there really is somebody that needs to be a champion, pick the baton up and run with it. And I um, just congratulate you on doing that. You know, I, I go back to the three questions I always ask, what, so what, now what? Well, the what is we've got a biopsy requirement to diagnose NASH. You know, it's noisy. It's a representatively small sample, one thousandth of the liver by a, by a lot of accounts. There's lots of interpreting variability. We call it inter and intra-observer variability. The overall gestalt diagnosis of NASH, or you look at the individual components that make up NASH, um, they range from poor to, to good at best. You know, it's an invasive, it's an obtrusive test. I think Donna's even said it one time or another on this podcast, when approached with the option of a liver biopsy, she doesn't just run for the hills. She she uh, says, no way, and look for alternatives to get the information you want. So I think, you know, look, I, I'm a hepatologist. I've probably done over, well, I don't know how many thousands of liver biopsies I've done. I've done a lot in 20 years, but I, I personally would find it challenging to have a liver biopsy done on myself. So I do think we, you know, the what is liver biopsy has its inherent problems and it's, it's not the gold standard as, as Donna mentioned. So what, so what about it? Well, we've got to find a non-invasive test. That's a no brainer, you know, and, and, but the issue is there's not one size fits all, right? We've talked about this before. Also, there are three different contexts of use that I envision for non-invasive testing. The first is diagnostics, you know, show me the population I need to worry about. There was another uh, listener on the podcast that said, don't show me who I need to worry about, show me who I don't need to worry about. Because at the end of the day, if there are 100 million Americans with fatty liver, many more around the world, show me the 80% solution. And the 80% solution is who you don't need to worry about today. And then we'll focus on the 20% once we nail down the 80. You can look at it two different ways, but at the end of the day, you need a test to do that. Is that a blood test? Is it an imaging test? Well, right now, our data suggests really it's a combination of both or a combination of multiple different wet biomarkers. The problem with all those is that they're not validated. So the word of the day is validation, validation, validation. You have to have that to get buy-in from the agency, the payers, and everybody in between before it becomes an acceptable surrogate. The second context of use is markers of therapeutic response. So as we get drugs coming on the market, how do we know they're working? And that may be the furthest along because pharma companies who have jumped into NASH head first trying to find therapies, and boy, do we have some good ones in development have begun to incorporate these non-invasive tests along with histology. So what we call companion diagnostics and data, which was presented at the ILC by Rohit and some by myself, show that we're at least with some drugs able to really get after measuring therapeutic response. We're not done, we still have more to go, but there's a pretty good head start, at least in that context of use. And then finally, long-term patient outcome measures. And finding a test that I can do today in clinic, that I can sit down with my patient and say, you know what, 
based on the results of this test in five years, you have X percent chance of having decompensating disease, progression to cirrhosis or whatnot will really be important. Those are also under development, um, but I think we still have a ways to go there. So again, I, let me circle back around and say kudos to Donna and, and, and the Global Liver Institute for really taking the mantle. I, I thought this would be carried by pharma once there was a drug that was approved, but knowing the challenges we've had with that, I think in the intervening period, uh, disease awareness, beginning this campaign on beyond the biopsy is really coming at a critical time because we're realizing the challenges of liver biopsy really in all of those three contexts of use that we mentioned, but mainly for clinical trials as we develop drugs for NASH and getting at a non-invasive test is absolutely critical to be able to advance the frontiers of medical science as it relates to fatty liver disease. So my hat's off to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for that really articulate uh, breakdown uh, of, of the key areas and, and the key value cases. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. And I'll say this again. Congratulations, Don, on a, on a fantastic and fantastically needed program. You made the comment that we needed to converge on a test. I may have heard it more literally or more singularly than you meant it, but I'm wondering exactly how much clarity do patients need before they're willing to step into doing this? How much clarity do, not not leading hepatologists, but, but primary care and, and, and other physicians need to, to trust? Um, is it enough to say, here's step one, here's step two, here's step three, and have a few different options at each step? Particularly, you know, that as Stephen points out, you got three different points on the pathway that you're looking at. Well, even that is a huge advance over, you know, where we were starting, you know, uh, two years ago. Um, was just, okay, it, it was like somebody just um, tipped over the Scrabble board or something. It was just like, and here, Donna, put together these letters and numbers in, you know, in some form or format, and then go call, you know, the American uh, College of Physicians and tell them we want to do more with NASH. It just wasn't going to work that way. So to be able to say to them, yes, there are several tests that are e evolving in uh, their state of validation. I agree that is the word of the day and the evidence generated around their their use. But we are able to say uh, and better match this, you know, this test or this set of tests for this particular use, clear out the noise, this set of tests for this particular use, and then this set of tests for this particular use. That you could start putting into a clinical workflow. That you can, you can start making sense of. It's still not, you know, the holy grail of having a, you know, HbA1c test that determines it all. But it it gets us a lot closer to being meaningful on the clinician side. On the patient side, it really is about the so what in in Stephen's, uh, you know, progression there. So what does this you know, any test that tells me this is how my liver is functioning and so I need to take what, you know, what, this particular set of steps or it tells me that I have, you know, the, the likelihood of this many years before I hit cirrhosis or cancer or need a transplant is therefore meaningful. And we're getting closer to that. And that's exciting. And defining, I think part of this campaign, if it is successful, will help add to that clarity of defining what is meaningful, both, you know, what is meaningful, what are useful product features for, for tests, for usability all the way around, and what are meaningful results of tests or combinations of tests for people so that they can we can move forward those that ha those that have that meaning and deliver that that value. Just one more question about the program, which is if, if our listeners want to catch up to the various events that are left or go back and catch earlier events, how do they do that? They can go to um, our globalliver.org forward slash beyond, and we'll have information on the shows and any content that we are have or will create. And then what events do you have upcoming? So we have uh, Massachusetts coming up. Our, our, our 
PLI live episode featuring our Massachusetts contingent, and uh, that includes uh, Dr. Ray Chung, uh, will be on September 16th at noon uh, Eastern Daylight Time. I believe we're still on Daylight Time on Facebook, and then we'll post it to YouTube on September 21st uh, at 1130 Eastern Daylight Time. Our New York panel will air and then on September 29th, at a very special time, because Arun is very special and worth uh, rejiggering my calendar for, um, so that will be at 3.30 Eastern Daylight Time on September 29th, which is also the 26th anniversary of my liver transplant. So it is a very special day. And that whole schedule is on the globalliver.org website. Fantastic. Question to the team, starting whoever would like to. So Stephen identified the three different sets of needs or value that we get from going beyond the biopsy. What do you think will be the most important shift in any of those or in each of those as we start to move beyond the biopsy and into an era when validated tests are actually driving treatment decisions a lot more simply and, and um, in ways that are easier to execute. What's the big thing that changes first? And how does it change? I suppose, going back to what Stephen said from the patient comment or the comment that was received about tell me the patient I don't need to worry about. I think it's being able to get a change in primary care that means everybody walking through the door, irrespective of age, is considered at risk. If we start with the premise that everybody's at risk and funnel it down because we can look at diagnostics beyond biopsy. It's already been discussed in different categories and criteria, but some may require different ones. But we need to first identify that there is a problem and Rachel Pryke, the GP who presented very well at the digital conference, was very open on the fact that most primary care physicians misinterpret liver function tests, particularly normal liver function tests, as absence of liver disease, which we know it's not. So I think it's changing that paradigm is the first way to get beyond the biopsy um, from what Stephen was detailing. So we need to start with mechanisms where we can identify in primary care to make it easy to get better testing, to get better referrals into secondary care. And I think once you get better referrals, then you can get better specific diagnostic accuracy that's reproducible, it's convenient and it's cost effective. And I think we've heard multiple times the the threat and the rise that liver disease is projecting with obesity over the next 10 to 15 years. And liver biopsy is just not an option in the number of patients at the rate that liver disease is increasing. And I think the Beyond the Biopsy campaign is absolutely vital because if we don't look now at trying to isolate finding these patients, then how are we ever going to turn around the tsunami, not only NASH, but of all other areas of liver disease globally. So that's where I think we need to be heading. And I think we need to be looking very rapidly at how we can get these tests in and did and COVID may have helped that. People are far more accepting of telehealth. They want their tests more locally now. They don't want to have to go to major centres. They don't want to have to go to clinical research institutes if they can get their clinical research screening more locally. And I think Stephen would be best placed to sort of answer that side. But we need to now be putting in as much diagnostics in to help primary care as we can, as soon as we can. And beyond the biopsy, if it helps that, in the US, then that will replicate around the world, I would hope. You mentioned something that reverberated with me a bit, and that is, I just keep going back to the, how simple can we make this? How simple can we make this for everybody involved, for the, for the patient, for the frontline physicians, for the payers, for the politicians, lobbyists, you know, not-for-profit organizations, Everybody involved. How do we make it simple? In the military, we have this thing called the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. And you know where that, when you were commenting, where I went immediately to was back to Iraq in 2009 when I deployed to Tikrit. And I remember over and over again seeing many trauma 
evenings where, you know, boom goes the dynamite and in come the birds and the birds being the incoming Black Hawk helicopters with the trauma patients. And our trauma surgeon was very, he was an amazing surgeon, young guy, but he kept it really simple and he trained the medics and he had them down to just a very set of simple pragmatic rules. And it, it was make them naked, roll them over, chest x-ray. That every single trauma patient that came in the door got the same exact treatment because he had learned over the years that if you didn't look everywhere, you could miss a bullet wound where it went in a little tiny hole. You didn't roll them over and it came out the back and there was a major problem that you didn't look for or a pneumothorax that just wasn't picked up right off the bat. Those three simple principles basically saved every single person's life that came into to crit at the 47th Army Combat Surgical Hospital. We did not lose a single life in seven months if they came in with a heartbeat because of him and his very simple, pragmatic set of rules that he applied. And if you take that to the U.S., everybody that works in the ER, my brother's an ER physician in Jackson, Mississippi, they, they do fast exams. They do ultrasounds on the abdomen and every patient that comes in with trauma because they've, they've learned that's a simple tool to find something that they may not know and identify it early and then get them to care. So we have to come up with some very simple set of guidelines for primary care or a very simple set of rules for our patients to ask the right questions. And I think we're not quite there yet. You know, if you think about where we are, MRI is a great tool. It's not readily available in every street corner and not all MRIs are created equal. I learned that the hard way. Siemens, GE and Philips all have different hardware. They all carry different software. All weren't put into use last year. So there are several that are old, they're very expensive and they can't run the applications like MRI PDFF or MRI elastography, for instance, without significant upgrades and significant cost. So, but that's a good start point, right? So we have MRI PDFF, it's now the gold standard for fat. How do we develop even simpler tools that correlate with MRI PDFF that are handheld, that can be point of care test and used in the clinic? And fiber scan is a, is a good start at that. It gives us CAP, controlled attenuation parameter, that tells me yes or no for fat. It doesn't do a good job of quantifying the fat though. And maybe we don't need that just as a yes, no. Um, but again, that's a start, but is it the finish line? Can we put a fiber scan in every clinic? Probably not based on the cost that's associated with it but it's another step in the right direction. And I think as long as we're continuing to evolve these principles and these diagnostics, we will get to the simple answer. In the meantime, you know, we're left with, again, validating what we have so that we can develop simpler tools to use against those surrogates that have now been validated against either biopsy or the gold standard MRI, whatever it might be. No, absolutely. I think if I remember, you were on the paper that was that Phil Newsom did on Smart Exam, the new upgrade to Fibre Scan. Uh, it's called Smart Exam, isn't it? Where they, they they're going to calculate the attenuation over something like 500 readings rather than just those 10 because it becomes more accurate. Does, That's how did correct. You, so do you think that is a way to go? I can get you fibre scans in every primary care if you want one. Um, but um, <laughs> that's my goal, so yeah. So in the US, unfortunately, we can't get fiber scans everywhere just because of the cost. But but I do think it's a step forward. It's exactly right. We, we, we evolve these tests either through refining them internally and then testing them externally, or we identify something on the front line and it gets taken in house, tested and validated again. Or it's a combination of something old with something new. And I think that first step we saw was taking a very old and tried and true biomarker, aspartate aminotransferase or AST, and combining it with CAP and KPA and came up with FAST. Or very simply, you know, the, the, the uh, FIB4 and even the NAFLD fibrosis score are a large part predicated on the AST value. So AST-ALT ratio is one. 
so if I were, you know, maybe in Donna's shoes, one of the things I would push for is something very simple like the AST-ALT ratio. You know, we know yeah. this is ALT predominant disease. When AST rises to the level of ALT, that's bad. So that's something that we can at least take out to the populace and say, hey, are you aware of this? I don't know how many times I go to talk to primary care because we do a lot of that here in San Antonio, delivering just awareness. And I say, and they always ask, what's something simple I can do? I'm like, mm-hmm. take your diabetics and look at the AST value. Mm-hmm. If it's yeah. close to the ALT, red flags should be flying, spidey senses should be tingling, that patient needs to be referred. And then we'll take it and run with it. But that's where it starts, right? And then mm-hmm. each time that happens, doctors are very interesting. We we can read New England Journal. We can read Annals, JAMA, Lancet. And we may not change our practice based on one double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial. But you give us one anecdotal experience that we remember, it changes our practice forever. Educating them one at a time. The problem is you need an army to do that. And again, kudos to organizations like GLI for beginning to put that campaign together. Thank you. But it's, you know, it's only as good as, as this type of information. And we did mention that, uh, that AST, ALT ratio, as well as starting, you know, with Moz's paper, of course, that we discussed uh, in, in a previous episode on the cost effectiveness of screening of patients with type 2 diabetes. You know, we do want to reinforce since, you know, our starting point amongst many physicians is that NASH doesn't really exist. Um, You know, it's not real or we're just overstating or overblowing this. And so to give them a sense of, you know, success and a sense that this is real and some momentum and, 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 and traction, I think you're absolutely right that having something as concrete as a ratio of blood tests that they're already taking and, you know, and a diagnosis that they already, you know, have or can easily get. Um, and using that as the first line of decision making, I mean, I, I do stay up at night always thinking about who do we miss, whether that's in looking at different cutoff points of different tests or intermediate ranges of of patients um, in different types of tests. But we're at such the beginning of this field. And I think, you know, Roger, it's great that you, you know, sort of anchor us in in thinking about what does it, what will it look like in 2025? Because right now we do have to recognize that we're still at the early stages of this field, not as early as we were, thank goodness. Uh, We're making progress, I think, truly quickly with so many minds on board, whether that's in academia or in clinical practice uh, or in research or in, in, in the pharmaceutical companies, there are different combinations and partnerships of, but we will soon, if we need to have the larger traction and the larger policy making, and if we want to uh, make the most of our time in the spotlight, We will need to uh, distill things to its essential essence and um, and to have these very simplified. So, Donna, let me let me throw one out in in the early days of of cholesterol. Right. First challenge was getting a cholesterol test and triglycerides into everybody's standard blood panel. The second test was getting HDL and LDL fractions in. The third test wound up being getting lab core requests in in the labs not to define elevated as the top 5% of the population, because if 80% of the population has a problem, then the top 5% just doesn't matter, right? And the reason they did that was because they knew that in primary care, whatever anybody said, most of the uptake was gonna get picked off a lab report by something that was flagged as an abnormal value. So I I don't look at other people's bloods and I haven't had my own take in a while. Is the AST to ALT ratio a standard, for example, on on, on the readouts that you get when when you take blood tests? Patients. I'm literally reaching in my drawer right now. I can answer that for the UK and the fact that it's not standard. And maybe keeping to Stephen's kiss analogy in the fact that keep it simple stupid is maybe what we do need to do, is make that a uniform test throughout the world just and keep it simple. That, that's where I go first. I mean, and, and Donna, the same thing wound up happening with diabetes. So long before you get to HbA1c, you've taken measures that aren't necessarily very good but serve a purpose and put them to that purpose, which tends to light up the society on how big the issue is, as well as starting to get people treated. Yeah, I, um, I'm looking through and I have the advantage 
of looking through um, labs assigned from a variety of specialists uh, here in the in the DC area in a relatively short span of time. Each of them do have individually AST, ALT, and then uh, alkaline phosphatase, but they do not have the AST, ALT ratio. They do have the albumin globulin ratio on them. And the, of course, in the BUN creatinine ratio. So it's not as if it's a hard lift, I'm thinking, of the various lifts I have to do. Uh, but so I think this is this is excellent. I love this podcast. Now we have, I have outcomes and marching orders from it. So yes, I, if that is something that is helpful, I think that that is a reasonable, achievable ask. Back at, back at KISS, any flag that's a good flag is a good idea, right? Yeah. So that's great. Steven, you're unmuted. What did you want to say? Well, I was going to say the Texas flag, obviously, is, you know, very important. <laughs> but, you know, just to keep it light. Uh, but, you know, so so we, this has been known for a long time, uh, even back in 08 when uh, Beth Brunt and, and others from St. Louis University uh, and I published data on the different stages of NASH. And we looked at lots of variables to include ALT and AST and AST ALT ratio and showed that there's a rising AST over time. And actually ALT tends to plateau at stage three and, and then kind of rapidly falls as you progress into four. And actually it's not unusual to see many patients with cirrhosis that have completely normal serum aminotransferases. But one interesting characteristic about the cirrhotic NASH patients, if the liver enzymes are normal, the AST will always be higher than the ALT. And in fact, in a few cases, the alkaline phosphatase will begin to rise. We published that paper many years ago showing that postmenopausal females with cirrhosis, it's not uncommon for them to have normal ALT and AST with the AST higher than ALT and the alkaline phosphatase to be slightly high. Not in the PVC range by any means, but you know, 130, 140, something like that. But very pragmatically, when we developed the BARD score, which is BMI, AST, ALT ratio in diabetes, which back in the day um, I, I was developing as a, as a liver fellow at the same time the NAFLD fibrosis score was being developed by others. The AST-ALT ratio was one that came out over and over again a multivariant logistic regression as being an independent predictor of advanced disease. And it's, it, it was down to 0.8. You didn't have to be one you know, AST equaling ALT, that's a ratio of one. But even at 0.8, it became very, uh, very important. So I I think absolutely, if we could, if we could get that added to the lab listing through BARD or, or, or through a Quest or LabCorp mm -hmm. or whoever, it would be very instructful. We would have to make it known though, that, that normal liver enzymes uh, don't necessarily mean the patient is out of the woods. But for, again, just identifying a flag, putting it red, putting an H out beside it or something, mm -hmm. at least it would get somebody's attention. I tell them how many times the patient comes to me and says, Doc, this is red, there's an H out beside it, and it's really like, um, you know, it's a subtype of a white blood cell, right? Maybe mm -hmm. it's, a, you know, a, a neutrophil or a lymphocyte right. or it, and it really has no bearing on the patient's uh, quality of life or even their current health, but it's flagged as an H, and so they're worried about it, right? I think that would be helpful. So, Stephen, let me ask just a couple of questions. What percentage of, of the population overall would you guess um, would get flagged on that, on the ratio, say at 0.8 or at 0.8 or at 1? Uh, that's a good question. I would be really guessing. Uh, you know, I would suppose maybe 5% of the population. Good. The reason I ask the question is that it doesn't make an exceptionally sensitive measure because an awful lot of people, more than 5% of people have, have, have are challenged, but it's a great start. But listen, 5% of 100 million, I don't know how many times, you know, even my 20-year-old in college, he goes for his routine checkup and they're wanting to test his cholesterol, they're wanting to get an A1C, a glucose, check his blood pressure, get his lip, you know, at, but, but they don't talk to them about fatty liver mm -hmm. at all. They don't normally get a set of liver enzymes. So in fact, just thinking back to the ILC in that paper, was it uh, abstract GS08, if I remember right, Louise, they didn't even, 
they didn't even have AST. They ordered ALT, and AST was not even part of their um, the routine practice. It's not part of the routine practice in a lot of the areas in the UK. And for the few pence that it costs, but then you get an argument higher up the management chain about not coming out of my budget. And I think this is where healthcare can become obstructive beyond belief in its silos, as actually it's about the person and the the whole, not about the individual pieces. And I think we have to be coordinating the best set of blood tests that we can get at every opportunity because I've said it before, when somebody gives blood or any tissue, it is vitally important that we as healthcare professionals take and use it in the best way and the most constructive way possible, not just repeat it or add another test because you get to a different specialist. Actually, we should be accumulating all of our best knowledge at the best times, not repeating patients coming in and in and in and trying to do that. And I think we do need to start doing more holistic assessments to get where Donna wants to be beyond the biopsy because if you get the best way to assess a patient holistically whether it's cardiovascular when I worked in intensive care we didn't just concentrate on one organ when we handed over we had a system and we worked through the organs and the systems and it was to make sure that we comprehensively handed over our patients and I think what we don't do in primary care and each of the specialities is start holistically and isolate down. Thanks, thanks everybody. Uh, Louise, that will be the final word for the day and a great note on which to close. And Donna, thanks for putting th together this inspiring program and, and really starting to move the ball up the field on the simple little things that, that are gonna make a big difference if you, if you can just get them over that line and keep pushing. Fantastic stuff. Closing question, same usual closing question. Did you hear anything today that surprised you or made you think differently about this issue? I know that Stephen has said, keep it simple, stupid before. And Stephen comes out with some very funny um, anecdotes every now and again. But actually this time I will remember it and put it into a lot of what I look at and see and do and see if that makes a difference because I try and make it as simple as possible but maybe I can make it even simpler. I will focus on the word of the day as validation because I realize that m as much as I want to simply be the advocate and as obvious as the, the solution um, or the end uh, result is to me, I can only go as far and as fast as the science and the evidence and the comfort level of all the stakeholders involved. And so validation is the key takeaway, at least for me. I don't know if there was a lot of surprise here for me, but, but there was some clarity. And that is, you know, I spend my day, they're long days, no doubt. And, and the days for me are spent around seeing patients developing drugs that treat liver disease for patients, and then developing tests that help me identify at-risk patients and whether or not they're responding to therapy. And I think this podcast has helped me gain more clarity around what those navigational beacons are, what my left and right boundaries are, and it's helped me gain a clear understanding of what True North should be. And to that end, I mean, just as an example, just focusing on AST-ALT ratio, as as a means to begin to foundationalize where we need to go with this and then build on that, I think is really, really important. So great podcast for me to walk away from. And thanks for uh, all the input today. I, I think it's just been phenomenal. Not a surprise, but a recollection, the power of that letter H on a test and what it, what it motivates patients to do. But if you put that together with an ASTALT score and you put an H on it, all of a sudden you have patients motivated to ask a question. You've got doctors that then have to figure out how to get an answer to the question. And that's really um, about moving the reference labs which is a different cast of characters, but people who are scientific and who will benefit from doing this. So I think this has been a good hour. Okay, I'll go to close. Go to the discussion group, the two questions that we're asking for, what should we make sure to do at AASLD in, in November, and what should we make sure not to do? Um, are there old episodes we should be going back to and, and rethinking and recalibrating? And uh, thanks again to Donna and to GLI for putting the program out there in the first place. It's a great program, it's a, and I look forward to this Wednesday's episode or version. Beyond that, it's just our special thanks for the day, Mike Wilson, our engineer, Buzz Sprout, Eric, Polly, Ryan, 
you folks who listen to this, uh, Louise, Donna, Stephen, we will be back next week uh, with another episode, the first autumnal episode, if you will, of Surfing the Nash Tsunami. Stay safe. Surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now.